Hey man, thank you everyone for being here this evening. I want to start off first of all by thanking Pastor Burzens for uh, giving me an opportunity to uh, preach this uh, evening and pray that it uh, be a blessing to you all. <clears throat> but uh, we're there in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 17. And uh, tonight's message will be more of uh, similar to a, a Bible study, it's nothing topical. So we're just going to uh, look at a few scriptures here. and We're just going to expound on the life and on the reign of Jehoshaphat this uh, evening. Uh, I, I really like Jehoshaphat because, you know, when I read through the Bible and I get to, uh, you know, the book of the Kings and the Chronicles, you know, the Kings and the Chronicles is just filled with all type of drama. You know, uh, if you read through, you know, Exodus and Leviticus, you know, it can get kind of slow as you're reading. But once you get to the Kings, that's when the drama kicks in. And uh, Jehoshaphat is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. I always slow down and read his story multiple times as I go through the Bible because he's just a fascinating uh, uh, character of uh, the Bible. So uh, as we're going to look through a few scriptures concerning uh, Jehoshaphat. One thing we can learn about Jehoshaphat and his reign is that Jehoshaphat, as we can see here from the scriptures, is that he was a man after God's own heart. OK, Jehoshaphat was a man after God's own heart. Look at uh, Second Chronicles, chapter 17. Look at verse one. The Bible say, says, and Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his stead and strengthened himself against Israel. And he placed forces in all the fenced cities of Judah and set garrisons in the land of Judah and in the cities of Ephraim, which Asa, his father, had taken. And the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the first ways of his father David and sought not unto Balaam, but sought to the Lord God of his father and walked in his commandments and not after the doings of Israel. So we see there right there that the Bible mentions uh, concerning Jehoshaphat uh, that he walked in the ways of his father. If you guys are, are very familiar with his father. His father is King Asa, you know, and Asa had a, a very great reign. And the thing about the kings is that <clears throat> the kings, you will have a time where there is a good king and he will have a good reign. But then the sun will, will rise up and he'll be just wicked, you know, and it was just this constant going back, back and forth of good king and bad king. But the thing about King Asa is that Asa trained his child right. King Asa put a lot and instilled a lot in his child Jehoshaphat. And basically Jehoshaphat, even in his adulthood, he basically lives out the commandments of the Lord. He lives out what was instilled from his father, King Asa. And the Bible says that he placed forces in all the fenced cities in verse two of Judah and set garrisons in the land of Judah and in the cities of Ephraim, which Asa, his father, had taken. And as we mentioned, Jehoshaphat is a man after God's own heart. Look at verse three. And the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the first ways of his father, David, and besought not unto Balaam, but sought to the Lord God of his father and walked in his commandments and not after the doings of Israel. So the doings of Israel was uh, constantly a back and forth, a time where they're worshiping God and they're worshiping Balaam, they're worshiping the devil. So it's constantly going back and forth, but not Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was steadfast in his belief. He walked after the commandments of God. Look at verse six. This speaks furthermore about Jehoshaphat, how he has a heart for God. The Bible says in verse six, and his heart was lifted up in the ways of the Lord. Moreover, he took away the high places and groves out of Judah. So notice that the Bible says concerning Jehoshaphat that his heart was lifted up in the ways of the Lord. Now, for uh, the fact that it says that his heart was lifted up, this is really, as I read this um, for this time around, just studying for this message, it hit me that the Bible said his heart was lifted up. Because usually when you hear about someone's heart being lifted up in the Bible, it's normally speaking about that person being prideful. Okay, for an example, King Uzziah. If you look at 2 Chronicles chapter 26. 2 Chronicles chapter 26, <clears throat> just a few pages over. And hold your finger there in 2 Chronicles 17. We're going to come back to it. 
But 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 16, it speaks about King Uzziah. And King Uzziah was a good king, but there came a time in his life where he got beside himself. Look at verse 16. It says, but when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. Now, the previous verses, I'll sum it up what has happened up to this point. King Uzziah is he if you research him, King Uzziah is like this military type guy. He has uh, this military mind. The previous verses here, he sets up bulwarks. He set up good, um, uh, good weapons of warfare. So he's a military st uh, strategist. And what happens is because he has such a good military, because he has so many men in his army, he basically becomes strong. His army becomes great. And you know what? This gets to his heart. This gets to his head and he becomes a prideful person. Verse 16 says, but when he was strong, that's speaking about his military strength based off the previous verses. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up. Now, isn't this the same language we just heard about King Jehoshaphat, that his heart was lifted up? But notice the difference here. His heart was lifted up to his destruction. King Uzziah. It said, for he transgressed against the Lord, his God, and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. King Uzziah got beside himself. He's militarily strong and he gets to the point where he's really just really feeling himself. And he goes off and he does the uh, the duty of the priest, which was to make this sacrifice, this uh, burning incense upon the altar of incense. Now, this is not what the king is supposed to do. This is a job that is strictly given to the priest to go into the holy place and, you know, make the uh, altar of incense to burn the incense. But because he's such militarily strong, he goes off and he figure, well, because of pride that's in his heart, I can go off and do it. God will be just OK with me, just how I am. You know, I go ahead. I, I I'm a good king. I have a good military. God will understand if I go into the altar of incense and light this incense here. But no, not so. The Bible said that he was lifted up to his destruction. Right. right? So turn back to Second uh, Chronicles, chapter 16. Excuse me. Second Chronicles, chapter 17. And the Bible says in verse six, and his heart was lifted up the same language there. His heart was lifted up. But here's the difference in the ways of the Lord. Right. Isaiah heart was lifted up to his destruction because he was a, a great military man. But here, Jehoshaphat, because he's humble, the Bible says his heart was lifted up in the ways of the Lord, which means that the Lord was his concern. The Lord was his state. The Lord was somebody that he wanted to walk after his ways. Basically, uh, excuse me, uh, his heart was lifted up unto the ways of the Lord. There is a, a great Psalm uh, scripture in Psalms chapter uh, Psalm chapter 119, verse 36. The Bible says, incline my heart unto thy testimonies and not unto covetousness. Well, what is the incline It's lifting up? So the same thing here with uh, Jehoshaphat, his heart was lifted up. So we see, uh, first of all, that Jehoshaphat was a man after God's own heart. Not only that, we see that Jehoshaphat is a fisherman of men. Jehoshaphat is a fisherman of men. Look at verse seven here. Verse six, we just speaking about in the previous verses how, you know, he's uh, a man walking after God. He's after God's commandments. His heart is lifted up in the ways of God. But then look at verse seven. Also, in the third year of his reign, he sent to his princes, even to ben Hale and to Obadiah and to Zechariah and to Nathan Hale and to Micaiah to teach in the cities of Judah. And with them, he sent Levites, even Shemaiah and Nathaniah and Zabadiah and Asahel and Shemiramoth and Jehonathan and Adonijah and Tobijah and Tob Adonijah, Levites, and with them, Elishama and Joram, priest. And look at this. And they taught in Judah and had the book of the law of the Lord with them and went throughout, went about throughout all the cities of Judah and taught the people. So we see not only in the previous verses that he's a man that's after God's own heart, but then also he's a fisherman of men. So we see that if you turn over uh, one more chapter, actually two more chapters to chapter 19, the Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 19. Look at verse four. The Bible says, and Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem 
And he went out again through the people from Beersheba to Mount Ephraim and brought them back unto the Lord God of their fathers. So what do we see there? We see in chapter 17 that he goes out because he's a fisherman of men. He goes out and teach in the cities of Judah. Chapter 19, again, the Bible says, and Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem and he went out again through the people from Beersheba to Mount Ephraim and brought them back unto the Lord God of their fathers. So we see that not only was Jehoshaphat a man after God's own heart, but he was also a fisherman of men. <clears throat> and how did he become a fisherman of men? Well, first of all, it started with the previous verses that he first was walking after God. That when you walk after God, you will seek to be a fisherman of men. We know this very famous scripture. You don't have to turn there. But Matthew chapter four, verse 19 says, and he saith unto them, this is the Lord Jesus. And he saith unto them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Now, I know that's a New Testament scripture. Even though Christ lived under the Old Testament laws and all. But even though we read this in the New Testament, this is actually a principle that still applies even in Jehoshaphat's day. Amen. That if you are a fisherman of men, even in, if, excuse me, if you are a follower of God, even in Jehoshaphat's day, guess what? You would be a fisherman of men. And that's what we see in Jehoshaphat's life. That because he followed God, because he sought to have his ways uh, to be walked after God's ways, you know what? He became a fisherman of men based off the previous scriptures we've seen. Because the Bible say that he went out and taught the people. Chapter 19 say he went out and taught the people and brought them back to the God of their fathers. He became a fisherman of men because he first was a follower of Christ, because he first was a, a follower of the Lord God himself. So we see that there, that guess what? This principle not only applies to Jehoshaphat in his days, even though it was Old Testament, but clearly it still applies for us today. This principle applies for us in the New Testament as well, that if we follow, guess what? We will become fishermen of men. The thing is, even though this saying here that I'm about to say, people normally um, ascribe it to prayer. <clears throat> I'm, I'm sure we all heard it. It says um, no prayer, no power. We all heard that uh, little prayer, little power. And then what's the last one? Much prayer, much power. If you all ever heard that. But guess what? It's the same thing with a fisherman of men. No following, no fishing. Little following, little fishing. Much following, much fishing. If you are a follower and abide in the word of God, guess what? You will do much fishing and you will bring forth much fruit as the Lord Jesus Christ has promised if we abide in him. So you just have to ask yourself when, you know, you just speak with someone, you know, you out and you, you ask them about the church and what do they do over there. And sometimes I because I I take um, great joy in soul winning and, and winning people to the Lord and everything. I will actually ask people, you know, uh, say a co-worker, I would just ask, so, you know, what type of ministries you have at your, at your church? You know, you are, you guys have the soul in the program. Usually what's that? So, and what's, what's, what's but like, well, maybe if they get this evangelizing, you guys evangelize. Oh, no, 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 no. Well, you know what that shows me? No following, right. no fishing. Right. You know, so if, a, yeah, we try to do a little bit of something, that means they're not doing nothing. Yeah, we try to get out and knock the doors, you know, every month or so. That means no, no following, no fishing. But praise God, you know, for a church like this, where there is much fishing going on, that means that there is much following going on as well. Much people are abiding in the scriptures as well. So we learn from Jehoshaphat that, you know what, Jehoshaphat not only is a man who has his heart after God, but he's also a man who is a fisherman of men. Thirdly, we see, if, uh, go back to the second Chronicles chapter 17. Thirdly, we see in second Chronicles 17 about Jehoshaphat, 
that Jehoshaphat was, will, was willing to share the load. Jehoshaphat was willing to share the load. He brought other people in to join with him. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 17 again. Look at verse 7. The Bible says, also in the third year of his reign, watch this, he sent to his princes. When he sent to his princes, what that means when he sent, he's basically calling them. He's summoning them to come in with him. That's what it means when he say he sent to his princes. And then he lists the names. I'm not, you know, uh, going to go back and read the names. But it said he sent to his princes. And look at the end of the verse to teach in the cities of Judah. Right. And then look at verse eight, the beginning. And with them, he sent Levites. So not only did he call his princes, you know, the princes, that's talking about authority. That's talking about governmental. He sent for his princes. These are rulers. OK, so he sent for the princes. Then he sent for the Levites. These were the people who had charge over the temple, you know, and in the wilderness. They were charged with uh, taking up, uh, building up the, the uh, tabernacle and taking it down and carrying it to the next destination. These Levites were workers in the temple. So he he's calling. He's summoning the princes. Those are your leaders is your leadership. Then he's summoning. He's calling in the Levites as well. And then. Look at the end of verse eight. He lists these names here. He says, uh, and with them, Elishama and Jehoram, priest. So he has three separate groups here. He has the princes. He has the Levites. And then he also has the priests. And these, him being a king, he is not trying to do this by himself. He's saying, hey, I need some help. I need you guys to come in on this thing and help me. Well, first of all, what do he need help with? Well, remember what the Bible says here after these uh, list of names. Verse nine says, and they taught in Judah. So notice why he brings them in so they can go out with him and teach in Judah. Go throughout all throughout Judah and teach. That's why he is bringing these fellow people in with him. So they can go throughout Judah and teach <clears throat> Jehoshaphat. He knows that this is a big task. What is the task? What do he want to do? You don't have to turn back there. But remember, the task is to bring them back to the God of their fathers. That's the task. And Jehoshaphat is not trying to do this on his own. He is summoning. He is asking these people to come in with him. He knows that he cannot do this on his own. Jehoshaphat is not trying to be a one man show. He recognized that if you're going to bring people back to God, to the God of their fathers, you know what? This is, will not be done by me alone. I'm not a one man show. But he expects team effort. He expects a collaboration from the uh, from the princes, from the Levites, from the priests. He wants them all to come in and help him to bring the people back to the God of their fathers. This is why I really like Jehoshaphat because he had a heart for people. He wasn't just so boasted up because he's a king. He's a really humble man. And I really admire this about him. He doesn't want to be a one man show, but he expects collaboration. He expects teamwork to get the, uh, to get the work of God done. Let's turn to Numbers chapter 11. This is a principle that is exemplified all throughout scripture beginning with Moses with Jethro uh, Moses is judging the people all by himself and Jethro comes and says what are you doing just paraphrasing what are you doing he said you're going to you're going to burn you burn yourself out he was telling him hey you need to put some responsibility on the rest of these guys around here to help them to help you you know to judge matters and everything so even then we see that Jethro was telling him, you cannot be a one man show. You have to get some help. You have to summon some help. Numbers 11. Numbers chapter 11. Here in Numbers 11, Moses here is at a point of distress. He is really requesting to die right now because the Israelites are complaining again. They were complaining about Egypt, how they had the best, you know, meats over in Egypt and the, uh, the best fish and everything. They said in verse five, we remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. They're just complaining about how good Egypt used to be. And Moses is basically to the point where he just wants to die. 
Look at verse 14, where he's just so overstressed to the point where he wants death. Verse 14, the Lord says here, uh, excuse this Moses speaking here. He says, I am not able to bear all these people alone because it is too heavy for me. And if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee out of hand. If I have found favor in thy sight and let me not see my wretchedness. And the Lord said unto Moses, look what he said. Gather unto me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people and officers over them and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation that they may stand there with thee. So even here, you can turn over to uh, Luke chapter 10. Even here, the Lord is not uh, allowing Moses to continue this to the point where he wants to die. The Lord is saying, you know what? No, grab 70 other men, elders, you know, and he's saying that they're going to help you in these matters. Luke chapter 10 the Lord Jesus has sent out 12 already. One of them is a the devil. So he sent out 12 already. And in Luke chapter 10, the Lord Jesus Christ sends out more. Verse 1 in Luke 10, the Bible says, after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also. Notice that he appointed other 70 also. So this is in addition to what he already has with the 12. He says, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place where he himself would come. So we see that the Lord Jesus Christ was not a one man show. He had other people as well. Yes, Jesus Christ came to seek and save that which was lost, but he didn't do it on his own. He had other people that was helping him. Moses. Moses had 70 others that the Lord had appointed with him as well. And we see Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat as well is not a one man show. Jehoshaphat basically looks for other men. He looks for other leaders and he wants them to come in with him on bringing the people back to the Lord. You don't have to turn there, but 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 2. The Bible says, thou therefore, this is Paul talking to Timothy. He said, thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So we see there that Paul is telling Timothy, hey, Timothy, don't be a one man show. I want you to take the things that you have been taught with the things that have been committed unto you, and I want you to commit them to someone else as well. So not even Timothy is a one man show here. You know what we need in the body of Christ? We don't need one man shows. We need help. Even a, a church being a one man show. Hey, here in Norcross, it's great to be a soul in the church, but you know what? We need help. If like Jehoshaphat, if we're going to bring people back to God, it takes help. You know what we need? We need just like Jehoshaphat needed. Jehoshaphat needed hands. He needed bodies. He needed people that was zealous. He needed people who could go out and bring the people back to God. And that's the same thing the kingdom of God needs today. That's what the body of Christ needs today. It needs people who are willing, people who are zealous, people who are not ashamed, people who are not embarrassed to be out looking to win that which is lost. The same thing that Stronghold Baptist Church needs. Stronghold Baptist Church. Now we're talking about the local church. Now, this local church right here, you know, we need people who are zealous, people who are on fire. Now, here it is. Not to say that we don't have that already. I mean, the Rogers family is, is coming from South Carolina. The Millers coming from South Carolina. Brother Brandon, Tuscaloosa, three hours away. If, that's, if that is not zeal, then I don't know what it is. Uh, Augusta, Georgia. Uh, other side of Atlanta. <laughs> I don't even know what part that is. But you know what? That shows that people are zealous, Amen. that people are willing to get in the fight and do this for the Lord, uh, for the Lord himself. Right. It's not a one man show. Jehoshaphat understands that. And he says, you know what? I'm getting the leaders. I I'm getting the, the 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 princes in here. I'm getting the Levites, the the um, the priests as well. And they're going to come in with me to bring the people back to God. Let's go back to uh, 2 Chronicles chapter uh, 17. 
Jehoshaphat, man after God's own heart. Jehoshaphat was a fisherman of men. <clears throat> Jehoshaphat was willing to share the load. He wanted to bring people in. But not only that, Jehoshaphat, if he was going to bring people back to God, you know what he said he's going to need? He said he was going to need the word of God. He was going to need the word of God. Verse 7 and 8, we already know that verse 7 said to teach in the cities of Judah. That's what he wants to do. Chapter, uh, chapter 19 spoke, uh, speaks about how he was looking to bring the people back to God. But look at verse 9. Verse 9 says, and they taught in Judah and had the book of the law of the Lord with them. He wants to bring the people back to God. He wants to restore them, reconcile them back to God. And verse 9 says, and they taught in Judah and had the book of the law of the Lord with them. So what's the deal here? Jehoshaphat wants to bring people back to God. He understood that this is a big task. If he was going to bring people back to God, he was going to need something powerful. He was going to need something that could convert the soul. He was going to need something that could get people right with God. And the Bible says that he had the book of the law of the Lord with them. The word law here, when it says that he had the book of the law of the Lord with them. And I like Psalm chapter 119 because it used a lot of words interchangeable. And it's all speaking about the word of God. It may say the statutes of the Lord, or it may say the law of the Lord. It may say th thy precepts. And it's all speaking and is using interchangeable words concerning uh, the word of God. So whenever you in Psalm chapter 19, just know when you hear that the statutes, precepts is speaking about the word of God. So what did Jehoshaphat and his men have when they went out to bring them back unto the Lord? It says that they had the book of the law. They had the word of God with them. And this was what they were going to need to bring people back to the Lord. Jehoshaphat and his men were not getting people saved. They could not reconcile people back to God without the word of God. The thing is, you cannot bring anyone to God. You cannot save anyone without the word of God. Amen. And that is a statement that I stand on. That is a statement that I hold on to that nobody is getting saved unless the word of God is present. This reminds me in my earlier days of, of soul winning. I, I went out soul winning. You know, when you first learn how to. You know, to win people over to the Lord, nobody can stop you from going out. You're just like, I want to go out. You know, I, I want to be there knocking on doors and everything. And what was funny is my early days, I had that zeal. I went out with my Bible, but my soul winning partner had no Bible. So you want to know how that made me feel? You all remember when you was in school, you guys remember the, uh, the overzealous kid? The, the kid who would you know, bring his books to class. You know, the kid who had everything, you know, just down packed, they studied all the time. If the teacher forgot about an assignment to collect, they'd be the first one. You forgot the assignment? And all the, all the students in the class like, man, will you shut up, man, you know? <laughs> it, it, you feel like that student is always, you know, just on top of their game. And you know, and they're making you look bad and everything like that. And you know, that's how I felt that I showed up with my Bible and I just look like the overzealous because my partner has no Bible. Right. You know, he just going out free hand like, you know, <laughs> ding dong, hey, you know, nothing here. Right. You know, and I have my Bible. I'm looking like a geeky school kid right. with my Bible, you know, on the first day of class or something, <laughs> you know, and I'm just, that's how that made me feel, right. that I am just this overzealous person. But you know what, looking back, I had the right attitude. Because I realized that if I was going to go out and win souls, I could not go in it with my own strength. 
I cannot win somebody over with just my personal testimony. Oh, just let me give you a testimony about what God did in my life. Listen, I'm all for testimonies. I'm all for, you know, telling people how good God has been to you. But listen, that's not going to save anyone. It is impossible to win someone over to the Lord without the word of God. The word of God must be present. Listen, I am. This is another statement I stand on. I am against no Bible evangelism. I'm against no Bible evangelism. Now, let me make myself clear. I'm not talking about the evangelism where you find yourself giving the gospel in a situation where your Bible isn't present. You know, if anybody had been so in any amount of time, you'll find yourself in situations where your Bible is not present. And this is the reason why scripture memorization is good, especially soul winning verses, because I have been placed in situations many times where I get to ask in that important question about their salvation. And you know what? That person needs to be saved right then and there. My Bible isn't nowhere to be found right now. But guess what? It's right here. It's right here. It's in my heart. I have written his word in my heart. And that's why it's important to memorize these scriptures, because you will find yourself in situations where you at the store, you at a mechanic shop or so. And you know what? Your Bible isn't near. And what do you have to do? You have to preach that gospel word for word, line upon line, precept upon precept, clearly so that person can hear the gospel. So I'm not against that type of evangelism, but I am against the evangelism where you purposely go out without a Bible, where you set up a time where you say, I'm going out to knock doors today and you just go out with no Bible. Listen, I am wholeheartedly against that, that type of, uh, you know, evangelism where people go out, you know, I'm just going to go out and tell them a story about Christ. You know, I'm just going to shoot from the hip, you know, let them get it. You know, Christ died for us. Christ rose again. You know, uh, Christ, you know, he sits on the right hand of God. Listen, all that is true. And I'm all for that. But listen, if there is no scripture behind those stories, if there's no scripture behind that testimony that they can hear and place their faith on, that person is not saved and they yet abide in their sins. If if you don't give them the scriptures to back it up with that sweet story that you're giving them, right. they need to hear the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And this is a uh, consistent all through scripture. We finna look at some scripture uh, real fast and um, and uh, see that this is really consistent all throughout that nobody is getting saved unless the word of God is present. You don't see people just giving a story about Christ and then people getting saved. No, 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 no. They need to hear the scripture in order for them to get saved. Let's start with first Peter chapter one. The word of God must be present if someone is going to get saved. Let's see this consistently through scripture. First Peter chapter one, verse 23. The Bible says being born again, another term for being saved, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Let's turn to James chapter one. A few pages over to the left. James chapter one. Verse 20 through 21, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word. Watch this, which is able to save your souls. What is able to save your souls? The word of God. Look at uh, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter uh, number 3. Second Timothy, chapter number three, verse 14, 15, Paul is writing to Timothy. He says in verse uh, 14, he says, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. First Thessalonians. Chapter two, couple books over to the left. 
First Thessalonians chapter two. Verse 13 is one of my favorite. I think this is a very good verse if you're out sowing and someone says, well, the word of God right there, or you claim that's the word of God, but I don't take that as the word of God. You know, I think man wrote that book. You know what? This is a verse, a great verse right here. First Thessalonians chapter two, verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye receive, watch this, the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Paul say, hey, you didn't receive this word. When we came to you, you didn't say, hey, that book is written by man. They said, hey, that's the word of God. Paul said that is how you all received it. You received it not as from men, but as it is the word of God. And notice that he says the word of God, which ye heard. Nobody gets saved, my friend, just off your story. They need to hear the uh, scriptures that follow behind it. Ephesians chapter one, one of my favorite. I use it in every uh, single soul winning presentation. Ephesians chapter one, verse 12. The Bible says that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ and whom ye also trusted after that. Ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Second Corinthians chapter five. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 17 through 19. He says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Notice what. Uh, the Bible just called the word of God when you're going out getting people saved. Notice that he called it the word of reconciliation, which means that you cannot go and reconcile anybody to God without his word. It's called the word of reconciliation. We need the word. Acts chapter 16. You're saying, oh, you're belaboring the point. Well, not everybody get it. <laughs> Acts chapter 16. Very famous. I'm sure a lot of people use this doing so and including myself. Acts chapter 16, verse 30. And brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? This is the jail guard who is basically watching over Paul and Silas and the rest of the prisoners. And Paul and Silas are in prison right now. And you know what? The earthquake, because they've been praising and singing late in the midnight hour, the Lord sends an earthquake. And he basically shakes the jail cell and the doors fly open in the jail cell. This man comes, the jailer comes trembling. And verse 30 says, and brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. But I love the following verse. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord. And to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized. He and all his straightway. Great scripture for baptism as well. Right. But notice that they preached to them the word of God. Acts 8. Saying again. Yeah. More scriptures. Yeah. Acts chapter 8. Verse 12. This is Philip preaching. But when they believe Philip preaching, that means they heard the word. But when they believe Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized. Stay in Acts chapter eight. Look at verse thirty five. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him. Jesus seems like, you know, is there is anybody? I'm sure everybody has it here, but not everybody believes this, that, you know, well, you, you don't have to have the word of God. Well, we see in people who starting at the same scripture that speaks about Jesus in the book of Isaiah. And he stayed right there in Isaiah and he preached to him. Jesus. Almost done with these. Acts chapter eight. Actually, no, I'm sorry. Mistake. John, uh, the Gospel of John. 
chapter 4. While you turn there, one of my favorite soul winning verses. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on, me, on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. He said, he that heareth my word. Gospel of John chapter 4. I love this one here. This is the lady at the well. And she goes off and she tells everyone what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. And notice this. She went out and she said, hey, come meet a man that told me everything I ever done and everything. But let's see if that is what really saved the people. Look at verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified he told me all that I ever did. Amen. People believed, right? Absolutely, because of what she said. But look at verse 40 as well. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. Watch this. And many more believed because of his own word. And said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Hey, her testimony did some justice as well. Many people believe. But notice that the Bible says as well. They say, hey, we believe not because we heard you, but they said because we have heard him for ourselves and we know that he's the Christ. Right. Last scripture here, Luke chapter of 24. Luke chapter 24. This is the being on the road to Emmaus. This is post-resurrection. The Lord Jesus Christ has recently been resurrected. And you have the two men on the road to Emmaus. They're downcast. They're sad as they walk along the road. And verse 25 says, Then he said unto them, O fools, this is Lord Jesus talking, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Verse 27 says, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Look like Jesus himself knew that he should use the word of God. The Bible says that he expounded unto them in all the scriptures. Can you imagine? This was a long walk. Jesus did all the scriptures, all the prophets. You say, what are you trying to say here? You, you believe all I'm trying to say is that nobody gets saved without the word of God. Amen. That's all I'm trying to say. Nobody gets saved by your sweet, cute, summing it up of the gospel of just, you know, Jesus Christ died. You know, you're a sinner. Now call upon the Lord right now and get saved. No, it doesn't work like that. You take your time. You be patient with people. You compare scriptures th with spiritual things with spiritual things. You open up the gospel and you expound to them on the scripture. Lifestyle evangelism, door hangers doesn't work. Windshield flyers doesn't work. I got many of those on my on my windshield and it doesn't work. I was not compelled. It doesn't work. The Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Let's turn back to Second Chronicles chapter 19. So we see Jehoshaphat had the law of God with them. Jehoshaphat and his men, they didn't go out just freehandly. Just, just, you know, no Bible. They, we're just going to go out and just tell them, I'm the king. You're the princes. You're the Levites. And, and that should be good enough to bring them back to God. No, no, no. The Bible says they had the law of God with them. Not only did he have the law of God with him, we learned from Jehoshaphat as well that Jehoshaphat, his life was a life of consistency. His life was a life of consistency. If you're there in uh, Second Chronicles, Chapter 19. Actually, let me get there myself. Second Chronicles chapter 19. Jehoshaphat life was a life of consistency. Look at uh, verse four. The Bible says "And Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem and he went out again through the people from Beersheba to Mount Ephraim and brought them back unto the Lord God of their fathers. He lived a life of consistency. 
The thing is, if you study Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat life is and his reign is sort of uh, is sort of a, a roller coaster It's up and down, up and down. He have good times. He have bad times. One thing that Jehoshaphat is consistent with as well. I'm not going to go too far in this, but he's consistent with just choosing bad friends. He just makes the worst of friends. I mean, if you don't know who his, you know, his close friend was, it was King Ahab, Jezebel's husband. That ought to be enough right there to just tell you, like, I don't need to be friends with you. Your wife worships the devil. I don't need to be friends with you. But not only that, but in chapter uh, number 20, he is you don't have to turn there. But later on, he teams up again with another wicked king of Israel um, by the name of Ahaziah, King Ahaziah, Ahaziah. Another wicked guy. The Bible says that he did very wickedly. Jehoshaphat is consistent. He's consistent at making bad friends. That's what he's consistent with. But also he's consistent in his work unto God. He lived a life of consistency. Look at verse four again. It says, and Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem and he went out again. Well, this is different. This is a different time than verse. I mean, than chapter 17, where we started at. Chapter 17, when he summed up the princes and everyone, he went out that time to bring the people back unto God. This time here, I don't know. The Bible doesn't mention how many exact days, how many years or months or so. But it says here that he went out again and brought the people back. Clearly, this is something that meant much to Jehoshaphat. The fact that he's doing it again, it means much to him that shows that he was consistent that's what it showed you know the christian walk the christian life is a life of consistency right. it's consistency it's day in and day out bible reading it's day in and day out praying right. it's day in and day out scripture memorization it's day in and day out listening to the right music getting the junk of the world out of you Every day, all day, every day. It's, it's a life of consistency. It's, it's a weekly or however much you do. It's consistency in soul winning. It's, that's what the Christian life is. That's what our walk is. It's a life of consistency. Uh, the Apostle Paul, you don't have to turn there. You can if you want. The Apostle Paul lives a life of consistency in Galatians uh, chapter number two. It's one of my favorite verses. Paul says, for I through the law am dead to the law. This is verse 19, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul was dedicated. Paul was a man who lived a life of consistency, a man who can get down to the end of his life and truly say, for I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. When you live the life of consistency, you can gladly say that, that that is how I live my life. My life was dedicated unto the Lord. The Christian walk is a, is a walk of consistency. You know, this reminds me of, you know, I was out uh, so in some years ago in my uh, earlier years. And I'm sure everybody has come across this person. You knock on the door. You try to be generous. You tell them where you're coming from. You ask them and they just cut you off. They have, you know, the, the track in their hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know what this is. I, I know. I know. Yeah, I know how to do this. This right here. I know this. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. I know all about this. We used to do this. And, you know, I came across a young lady that was like, that. I was just generous to her and she had a little attitude and she did that exact thing. Yeah, I, I know. I know. Yeah. I, you don't have to tell me. I know. I know. We used to do this. We used to go over across seas and do this. We, we used to. We, I used to do this. I know all about this. You know, I have to encourage her. I say, hey, well, I'm glad you did that. But let me encourage you to get back in the race, get back in the fight. Because you know what? It doesn't help if you know how to do something and you're on the sideline just bumping your gums against people who are doing it. And you're saying, I used to do this. Yeah, I know how to do that. Yeah. You're not telling me nothing new. I know how to do it. It doesn't help. 
actually, that speaks to your shame. If you say, well, I used to do this. I used to go out and knock doors. I used to win people over to the Lord. That's nothing to glory about. It really shows how far you have fallen from God. And we're not talking about salvation, but we're talking about a fellowship, a walk with God. It just shows how far you have removed yourself from God when you say I used to. It's just like, you know, I'm sure we heard all these testimony of the churches. Well, we used to run about 800 back in the day. Thousand on Wednesday night. What about now? Well, people just stopped coming. Well, we used to have 300 soul winners out. We had boy, them Jehovah's Witnesses were running when they seen us. Well, what happened? Well, I don't, I don't know. We used to do it. Well, it's not about what you used to do. It's about what you're doing right now. That is what the Christian life is about. It's not about what you did yesterday. Yeah, I got many people say, you know what? Just as fast as that came in, just as good as that was, guess what? It's forgotten about soon. You're going to have to come up with something else. You're going to have to get back out there because it's a life of consistency. One thing we can understand about consistency is that consistency starts with the parents. Consistency start with the parents. Look at first Samuel. First Samuel. And look at chapter two. This is Hannah, who was the second wife of Elkanah. Elkanah had two wives. If you go back on your own time, he had a wife named Panina, and he had a wife named Hannah. Panina had children. Hannah had no child, but she made a promise to God that if you would bless me with a child, you know what? I will basically, she was saying, I would dedicate him unto you. He would spend all his days, all his life serving you. That is what her vow was unto God. And that child just happened to be Samuel. Look at verse 18 of you there in 1 Samuel 18, excuse me, chapter 2, verse 18. The Bible says, but Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child, girded with a linen ephod. Moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year. When she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice, as I said, consistency in a child starts with the parents. If the parents will be consistent, guess what? The child is going to be consistent as well, because guess what? The Bible says in verse 19 that she brought Samuel a little coat every year, every year, not missing a year. And not only that, her visit was twofold to Samuel. It was not only to bring him a coat yearly, a new coat that he would get from his mother. But then secondly, it was the yearly worship because the Bible says that in verse 19, moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. So guess what? I believe this was why Samuel also abode in the temple. As he grew up, maybe because his mother was uh, was consistent, maybe because his mother consistently showed up for that yearly sacrifice and to bring him that coat. Maybe he learned some things from his mother, the fact that she's consistent. And you know what? Samuel was probably one of the greatest judges and, and prophets of the Bible. Let's uh, turn to Luke chapter two. We're seeing here that consistency starts with parents. Luke chapter two. We have. Um, we have Joseph and Mary. You know, they are the parents of Jesus Christ. And let me get this straight. Joseph is not the father of Jesus Christ. Now, if you say that Joseph is the guardian of Jesus Christ, I can go with that. But he's not the biological father of the Lord Jesus Christ. But yet the Bible still considers Joseph and Mary to be his parents. OK, uh, which proves that you don't have to give birth to someone biologically to be their parent. OK, um, look at verse uh, Luke, chapter two, look at verse 40. This is speaking about when the, uh, when Joseph and Mary, they went back uh, for Passover and they ended up leaving Jesus. Look at verse 40. It says, and the child grew. And this is the Holy Ghost talking here. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom. And the grace of God was upon him. Now his parents, as I just said. Now, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. 
So notice Joseph and Mary here. The Bible says that they went to the feast of the Passover. And then it mentioned that they went every year. Every year they went to the feast of the Passover. Now, remember, they don't live in Jerusalem. They have to travel. But this was something that they made it clear that they were not going to miss the Passover, this feast. And guess what? Not only because now we know the Lord Jesus Christ, he he was without sin. He was going to make sure that he made it to the feast and his doha. We understand that. But for teaching purposes, we also see that because they were consistent. Guess what? The Lord Jesus Christ was consistent with making the feast when he got older. If you all can remember, you can turn to Gospel of John, chapter seven. The uh, Gospel of John, they would have feast. And you know what would happen? People would get to whispering. You think he's going to show up? You think Jesus is going to come? They were looking out for him. They, they wanted to kill him. And the word was out. And they wondering, I wonder if he's going to come. I wonder if he's going to show up. Well, look at verse seven, uh, chapter seven of John. The Bible says, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee. For he would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews feast of tabernacle was at hand. Here's the feast. Here's a celebration. His brethren therefore said unto him, depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man thou that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. Then verse six says, then Jesus said unto them, my time is not yet come, but your time is all all way ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Go ye up unto, the, unto this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. So, hey, guess what? Jesus knows that a threat is out on him. Verse 1 says that the people want to kill him. So he stopped walking through Jewry. So guess what? He says, you go up to the feast. He tells his brothers who don't believe in him. You go up to the feast. He said, this is this not my time. I'm not going up to the feast. But notice that he says in verse 8, I go not up yet unto this feast. He said, for my time is not yet full come. When he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. So guess what? In spite of Jesus having threats on his life, you know what he did? He still showed up to the feast. In spite of people wanting to kill him, you know what that didn't stop him doing from doing? Serving his father, serving God the father. I'm still showing up to the feast. I know they want to kill me. And you know how bold he was even at these feasts. He'll show up in the temple and start preaching. And what would they say? You know, he told them, hey, I was in the temple every day preaching, paraphrasing. I was in the temple every day preaching. You didn't lay hands on me now. Oh, then. So he was consistently. And you know what? I wonder if it started with his parents who went up year by year. To the Passover, to the sacrifices. You know, yes, he had threats. And what can we take from the Lord Jesus Christ? You know what? Yeah, you may have some threats on your life. Yeah, may a persecution may come to this church. But you know what? Don't let it keep you away. Don't let it keep you out of the work of God and doing things for God that we ought to be doing. If you want to grow, uh, if you want your child to grow, guess what? In the things of the Lord, it helps when the parents are consistent. It helps if the parent consistently read their Bible, if the parent consistently pray and if the parent consistently go out and evangelize. You know what? It will spill off onto the kid. The Bible says train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Well, what is training? Teaching, guiding. That's what training is. Let's turn back to uh, Second Chronicles chapter 19. Second Chronicles chapter 19, we're going to end here. We see that Jehoshaphat not only lived a life that was a life of consistency, but he lived a life that was a life of determination, 
a life that was filled with determination. If you all are there in Second uh, Chronicles chapter 19, we're going to look at verse 1 through 3, and I'll sum this up for you. A, uh, excuse me, Jehoshaphat, as I mentioned, he consistently makes bad choices with his friends. Ahab is a bad friend. He joins affinity with him. Ahab wants him to come to war with him and join him in his fight. And what happens is he does it. Now, he almost get killed, but the Lord spared his life. Ahab, not so. He gets killed in the battle. And Jehoshaphat is returning from the battle. And look at the message he get here. Verse uh, number one in Second Chronicles 19. And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee, and that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land and hast prepared thine heart to seek God. Well, as I mentioned, there's this battle and Ahab doesn't make it through. He gets killed. Jehoshaphat comes back and the prophet here basically sends him a rebuke and says, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? This is pertaining to Ahab, because when you look back at Ahab, Ahab hates God. And then he is an ungodly person. So the Lord literally just tell a Jehoshaphat that Ahab hates me. That's what the Lord just tell Jehoshaphat. Should as thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? He says, therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. You say, well, how does this show that Jehoshaphat is a man of determination, that his life was a life of determination? Well, notice the last part of that verse said the wrath of the Lord is upon thee. The wrath of the Lord, the anger of God. God is upset with you, Jehoshaphat, because you joined affinity with the wicked man. And he says, yeah, there's some good in you in verse number three. He said, there's some good things found in thee that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land and has prepared thine heart to seek God. But yet the verse before he said, the wrath of God is on you. But you know what? Here's his determination, because in spite of the wrath of God on him and the fact that God was angry at him. Look at verse four again. And Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem and he went out again through the people from Beersheba to Mount Ephraim and brought them back unto the Lord God of their fathers. Well, what am I saying here? He has the wrath of God on his life. God is angry with him. And you know how he responds? I'm going to go on a missions trip. I'm going to go out and I'm going to bring the people back unto the Lord. The thing is, his determination is that he didn't allow what he did his sin to keep him out of the work of God. But he said right in verse four, right after God is angry, and has the wrath upon him. Verse four says he went out again and sought the people to bring them back. You know, most people, when they fall into bad sins, they just think that, you know, if, if, if this is a saved person, hopefully. But they just uh, they just feel that, you know what? Oh, man, I, I, I have hurt God so much. I have grieved the Lord and they just think that they're done. You know what? Jehoshaphat did something very grievously. And you know, his response was, I'm going on a mission trip. I'm about to go out and bring somebody back unto the Lord. What a good response because most people just normally just throw in the towel. How many times you show up at people's door and, and you try to get them to come to church? You, you, you're trying to, and they could be saved. And they, man, I haven't been in church in about 25 years. You know, and it's usually some grievous sin that has happened and they just think that God is just done with them and God cannot use them anymore. But we see with Jehoshaphat how he just bounced back. He literally goes out and seek to bring people back to God. Yes, God was angry with me. Yes, he's mad at me. But you know what? This is how I'm going to, re going to respond. I'm going to go out and bring the people back unto the Lord. Jehoshaphat, you committed an awful sin. I can imagine a press release. You committed an awful sin, Jehoshaphat. Your ministry is done with Jehoshaphat. What are you going to do now? Nothing, just go out, bring some people back unto the Lord. I'm going to confess it. I'm going to forsake it. I'm going to get right with God. I'm going to get in my Bible and go out and win somebody over to the Lord. Amen. That's what we see in the life of Jehoshaphat. What a man of God that Jehoshaphat 
is and we see through his reign. I mean, there's much more I'm sure that we can glean out of here, but we just see a lot of things that we can apply to our hearts. That for one, yes, be a, a person, a woman or a man or a boy or girl after God's own heart. You know, and, and be a fisherman of men, you know, be willing to uh, come uh, come on board. And, and that's it reminds me of this morning's message where, you know, we, we want to get people into the church. Well, here's the thing, not to just build some type of mega church. If it grows to that, well, praise God. But that's not our main objective. We want to get people saved. But yes, we want them to come to church. You want to know why? Because guess what? We can't do it on our own. And we're asking people, hey, yeah, we want you. Yeah, especially say people come on in, you know, help us out with this thing so we can learn that from Jehoshaphat as well. And we need that word of God. We go out to preach this gospel. And I know I'm just preaching to the choir here, but I'm talking to, you know, someone who may just feel, well, I don't think it's that important. Yes, it is very important. You need that word of God and we need to live a life of consistency and yes we will fall into sin this you know this type of of doctrine that's out where there's you know if you're saved you will never sin again that's an absolute lie uh i love just looking at paul in, in the uh in romans chapter 7 where he just literally spells out that he's struggling with sin you know and this this is uh is this that's the reason we need to be born again because this flesh is sinful but yet live a life of determination, a life of consistency and determination. Yes, we sin. But you know what? I'm going to get right with God. I'm going to get in his word. I'm not going to get out of the fight. I'm going to go ahead and get out and do great things for God in spite of. I'm going to confess it, forsake it. It's under the blood of Jesus Christ. And you know what? I'm picking up where I left off. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this evening. We thank you for these great lessons that we can learn from uh King Jehoshaphat, and pray, Lord, that we continue to search out these scriptures, Lord, and apply much more to our uh, learning and understanding. And uh, we just give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.